The following short stories were those provided by fellow subscribers, like yourself, in the comment section of the Fort Campbell Part 1 video. As a reminder, these stories were inspired by that of the young army specialist featured in the episode, and the story of a bizarre encounter he had while conducting a night patrol on the massive undeveloped range area of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, known informally as the Back 40. Fair warning, if you haven't watched the episode yet, the following short stories do contain spoilers. Now, after reading through these stories, I'm not sure if I should be surprised, but many of the writers of these stories shared similar experiences. I took the liberty to organize them to that effect. So, if each consecutive story seems similar to the previous one, that is why. But you can go and check for yourself. Their comments were posted completely separate from one another, and none of these stories were posted in response to someone else's. Christopher Castanon writes, I used to be stationed at Fort Campbell from 2000 to 2013, and the only weird story I remembered was an old German POW gravesite that lies on what's known as Old Clarksville Base there. The gravesite is supposedly haunted. Now, I did ask Christopher in a separate comment uh, to clarify because I was very intrigued by the idea of a German POW gravesite being on Fort Campbell, and he did respond. As far as I remember, there were multiple German POW camps in the U.S. This one, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, held POWs from 1943 to 1946. There were five marked graves there, and one for an African-American civilian buried around the turn of the century. I'd also heard that there were a couple of supposedly haunted places in the family billeting areas there, as well as some of the buildings, although I cannot say which buildings in particular, Hammond Heights and Pierce Village being the family housing areas. Now, the old bunkers in Clarksville Base were quite creepy in their own right. They dated back to the 50s and 60s and held nukes at one point. Brad Birch writes, I remember being on ammo guard every night for a month at Campbell. It was boring as hell. The bunkers there were a bit creepy, though. My wife was too scared to walk into them and look around. Army Medic 74 writes, I just retired from Fort Campbell and spent many hours in the back 40 in and around old Clarksville base, which had many old ammo bunkers. Used to have to do security checks out there while on staff duty. Never seen anything crazy like that, but always had an eerie feeling while out there. Needless to say, I didn't waste any time completing my checks. Caven Thibault writes, it wasn't until hearing that monstrous howl in the episode that brought back my own experience in 1995. Guard watch, late night at a Fort Knox motor pool. All these years, I thought our army drill instructors were playing wicked pranks on us. We heard these eerie, blood-curdling howls echo from the deep woods, across the road, beyond the fence. Now, I'm thinking, what if? David Kerr writes, I live about three miles outside Gate 10 of Fort Campbell right now. We've lived here since 2004. Our son had a Boy Scouts camping trip near a lake there in the back 40. Lake Kyle, I believe was the name. It was getting pretty late, and my son and I decided we'd walk up one of the ASRs to investigate a little, mainly because we wanted to see if we could find spent 50 caliber shell casings laying around. About 20 minutes into our walk, we hear this blood-curdling scream almost like a woman was being murdered. My first thought was bobcat, which are very common in the area, but something didn't sound right about the scream. It had an almost deep growl to it toward the end, like it was rabid. I could sense the fear slightly in my son's voice as he said we should go back, so we immediately turned tail and made our way back to camp. We stopped at the first nearest camp we reached and asked if anyone else heard the scream, and no one had. We never heard it again that night, nor did we ever see anything, but I always wondered if there was something out there. But then sometimes other campers like to play tricks on each other, so you never know. I would like to go back and do some more investigation on a good moonlit night, just to see what we could hear, and or see. Corey Sikaski writes, I was at Campbell with the 44th Medical Brigade, 531st Hotel Company, from late 2019 to late 2021. Just got to my new duty station, pretty much. And I remember how eerie Campbell gets at night. 
especially when there's cloud cover on the moon. There's been a few times I've had to be back in the back 40 at night, but I remember when I was going out for my expert field medical badge, and every night I'd walk to the stand-in showers that they had at Camp Hinch. I remember hearing the howls of something. My NCO just told me that there's wolves out there, but I really couldn't tell you. And walking around for land nav some nights was very creepy, considering we'd only ever have about 20 to 30 people out at a time for all that space. Sometimes it just felt like something was watching you in the pitch black, and you knew there wasn't anyone around you. It's all at night, so you would hear someone looking for a navigation point around you. But no, I'd just stop to look at my map or something, and I just wouldn't feel right sometimes. Just as if the air didn't feel right. Who knows, though. Vangelis Contogiorgakos writes, One night, during my military service, I was a sentry at the fence perimeter of the base. It was very late at night, and I was waiting for my replacement. Suddenly, I heard a blood-curdling scream that shook me to my core. Fortunately, it was just a fox, but it almost scared me to death. Liz Weber writes, I lived in Kentucky. I came across these creatures as well. They do migrate. I can't tell you why he gave chase, but I walked trails daily so you could say they knew my scent and where and what I did. Just as soon as you see them, they blend in when you look. But yes, they are there. They migrate in a clan, I guess you could say. Maybe all related somehow. But it was rare to see only one at a time. There were always at least one, and then another, or a few around. I found areas where they had footprints one day, hanging out all amongst pine trees. The next day I went back, it was as if someone took a brush and wiped them all away. But there was an assortment of sizes, even smaller ones. Mia Tolliver writes, Never was at Fort Campbell, but at Fort Bragg, and two of us saw a big something, bipedal, covered with longish hair, taller than my jeep, shortly before dawn. Weird stuff out there, no lie. Rod Stark writes, It sounds as if they encountered Dogman, not Bigfoot. I spent three years at Fort Campbell. It was my first active duty station in 1994. We were in the woods a lot, in field artillery. Twice, on guard duty, I saw a large, eight or nine foot tall, dark figure run by our camp perimeter at night, out in the back areas. I wondered about it, but I didn't feel worried. In field artillery, you're surrounded by your entire battery of men, about 60 of them, all night long for every field exercise. John Butterworth writes, I left Fort Campbell a year before Robert got there in the 80s. I'm sure there is a ley line there, and for those who are not familiar with the concept, ley lines are lines that crisscross around the globe, like latitudinal or longitudinal lines, uh, and they're dotted with monuments and natural landforms and carry along with them rivers of supernatural energy. Along these lines, at places they intersect, there are considered pockets of concentrated energy that can be harnessed um, by certain individuals or possibly creatures. The whole area, John continues, even off post, has some magical places we explored regularly. I experienced some loss of time there a few times. More than likely, there are deep underground military bases there with things going on. What a perfect spot to hide stuff and, or, open portals. Even Bigfoot found a place to hide and tag. You're it. Skinny White Guy M writes, My oldest son is with the 101st Airborne Screaming Eagles at Fort Campbell. There's many soldiers who have seen and heard these creatures there on base. They have an enormous deer population, and that's what makes it a paradise for any apex predator. There is likely very minimal human traffic in the thousands of acres of woodlands. Cameron Lott writes, We were doing some night ops on Campbell, getting dropped off by the birds, the helicopters, several kilometers out to conduct a movement to the target. Well, we walked up on something big. We never saw anything, but it certainly sounded like it was running on two feet. 
We were told to Charlie Mike, which is continue mission, and we did. P.S. I can't remember the name of the training town that we hit, but it had a big church on one end and a giant capitol building on the other. Mr. Pavey writes, I'm stationed here at Fort Campbell. I'll definitely be keeping my eyes peeled for Bigfoot or goblins on training events at night now. 13 Bravo writes, I was stationed on Fort Ord, California, or Planet Ord, as it was called, with the 7th Infantry Division, Light. I recall doing a 25-mile road march with my unit. We started at night, around 2100. I remember, as we were stretched out, you know that accordion effect of a long column of soldiers, we went by what appeared to be an old cemetery next to the road. The odd thing was there were what appeared to be green chem lights hanging in the trees. Our entire unit saw this and thought, how odd. Coyote 959 writes, there's a Ouija board carved into the deck plates of main engine room number one on my DDG, a naval ship, a guided missile destroyer. There have also been reports of a little girl appearing on the ship at night. I've never seen her, but I have a bottle of holy water on board. Ain't got no time to deal with that stuff on watch. Six Turning for Burning writes, I was in the Air Force from 1995 to 1999 as a weather observer stationed at Pope Air Force Base in Fort Bragg. At the far western end of the reservation is Camp McCall Army Airfield. When I was there, it was just a couple of runways and roads with a couple of small buildings and a tower. Most of the time, only a couple of guys in the tower and a weather observer are stationed out there because the place served as an emergency landing airfield. However, the place wasn't manned 24-7. At midnight, the people signed off and left, and the airfield remained unmanned for about eight to ten hours. I had heard two stories about McCall. First, a special forces guy was murdered out there while he was jogging. And the second story probably explains why he was killed. Drug smugglers would fly small airplanes in and out of there when the place was shut down at midnight. I did a shift out there myself to close out the observation station after the Air Force used the place for a deployment exercise and I can say that, yeah, McCall is out in the middle of nowhere, and I can believe both stories. The Dirty Badger posted, Having seen and been stalked by the giant cats of Afghanistan, Karakal are what they're called. These weren't as big as mountain lions, and not as stalky as lynx or bobcats. They were longer, slender, and about the size of a large Labrador. We had a drone operator radio us one night when he picked up its thermals. He told us that we had a lion or a leopard stalking us, about 25 to 40 meters to our right side. All we could see was nothing but the deadly Panjway grape fields. Artie fired some loom for us, but we never saw it. The guys in the talk got the drone feed on a big flat screen, and they got to see it. Also saw some of the famous vampire deer, or musk deer. There's plenty of crazy sounding stuff out there that people don't believe is real. Kurt Johnson posted, Listening to this while driving around duty as an MP in the Middle East. And again, Kurt, stay safe out there. As soon as I heard the intro, I thought I bet he was an MP. I've only seen one strange thing since being out here. Nothing super noteworthy. But we did have a patrolman state that he thought he saw a shadowy figure walk through a perimeter fence. The soldier immediately rushed to the location and found nothing. Very strange. Alastair Moonley, like Moody, writes, I served on Fort Campbell myself, was doing some field training and had to pull roaming guard at night. My buddy and I looked up at the night sky to see little lights moving around, like little stars dancing around and with each other. They were moving way too fast to have been man-made and moved around in unnatural ways. There's undoubtedly something weird about that place. Tough Girl 922 writes, I was in the U.S. Navy, 82 to 86, based at Pearl Harbor, and worked on Fort Island. They say the enlisted barracks out there are haunted. Never made it out there to check it out, but I did walk around the hangars. And yes, you can see the strafe marks on the buildings from the World War II attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. I have not been back since, 
but I hear there is a bridge out to the island now. Progress. P.S. I get the comment about being in the peacetime military. It still feels strange to me anytime someone says, thank you for your service. Linny writes, My husband works in a building on Sabre Airfield at Fort Campbell. He says he has seen strange supernatural things in his office, black shadows and moving furniture. He watched an office chair begin to spin so fast it was slung across the office. He took authority over his space and commanded every evil spirit to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, and it all stopped. He says there are so many people that come in and out of his office, and most of them have demonic attachments, so they bring these evil spirits with them. I know most people may not believe it, but these things are real. Deckhand Admiral writes, Back in middle school and high school, 2004-10, I was in the Sea Cadets, and we had summer trainings and such we attended, like JROTC and ROTCs. I decided to attend a Petty Officer Leadership Training, I think it was in 2007 or 8, at Naval Station Great Lakes, or Mistakes. The base stuck us in one of their less used barracks, BEQ-534, and there was a second similar barracks next to it, I can't for the life of me remember its name. They were both almost derelict in shape, and probably last used by active Navy in the late 80s. Anyone who has been to that base can tell you those buildings are trash hole asbestos claims. Anyway, we were berthed in 534 and we held typical barrack security watches. And for the two weeks we were there, every middle watch log entry had something wild reported. The first few days we thought it was all jokes, being a bunch of dumb 15 to 18 year olds. But that quickly changed. The experiences logged ranged from unexplained loud noises on third deck unexplained electrical failures on second deck, like lights flickering, knocking heard on the front door, and no one there or outside the building, to the security lock bands placed around the stairwell access doors that were supposed to designate off-limits areas being broken every night, only to be replaced, and then the next roving watch checks on the tags to find them broken again, rinse and repeat. Over the middle weekend, we had a group of Boy Scouts stay in the building, and we birthed them on the second deck. Their troop leader came down both nights they were there to complain about how loud and awful the cadets on the third deck were being, and that they needed to be disciplined. We had only males on the first deck and a few rooms for females on the second. Third deck was completely empty, with its bunk room doors supposed to be locked out and secured. The second week and last few days it ramped up to roving watches getting stranded in the dark with lighting failures and their flashlights failing at the same time. Mind you, there were no electrical issues during daylight. To hearing voices and shouts throughout the building on the various decks, to the most hair-raising, with the apparent phantom persons being chased through the second and third decks for about an hour, being reported as seeing the leg or an arm of a person turn the far corner and then giving chase to catch the person, only to find nothing, and turn back to see the same thing at the previous corner. Toward the conclusion of the training, the incidents and reports had been addressed by the command staff, usually retired, reservist, or board active duty helping out, and resulted in having the third deck totally locked out, and at least one of the command staff stand with each watch, to which they would hear and see the same things being reported, but would never acknowledge them or say anything about it, other than, it's just an old building, don't bother checking on it, and walk back into their office and shut the door. <laughs> Go figure. And dang, man, this Fort Campbell story kind of validates all the times I've driven that I-24 corridor, the uh, highway running by Fort Campbell, at night, and felt sketched out. Ozark Mountain Wanderer writes, We've seen lots of apparitions on CQ, which is Charge of Quarters, or Barracks Watch, in the old 2nd 320th F.A. Barracks, had a private look over at me one night and say, Did you see that, Sergeant? Yep. Get used to it. Rick Toe, 66 LCC, posted, I was with the 3rd Battalion, 502nd Infantry Regiment in Fort Campbell from 1993 to 97. This was the same infantry battalion which suffered that horrible plane crash returning from Sinai back in 1985. I was a buck sergeant back then, and some of my young soldiers living in the barracks 
would tell me that they would sometimes hear what sounded like a basketball being bounced against the wall inside barracks rooms, which should have been empty. They believed that the ghosts of those lost grunts returned to the one place they left, forever haunting those barracks. These last stories were more inspired by the personal story I shared in the credits of the episode about the midnight pizza run out into the Hawaiian jungle. Das Wolf writes, I was stationed at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii twice, so at Fort Carson I was with an aviation unit and we ordered pizza so many times the commanding general signed a letter banning all pizza deliveries on the ranges. Well, that didn't stop us. Either a bigger tip was in order, or we would meet the drivers at the gate to the ranges. Deep Ranger 930 writes, The outro reminds me of my time in the Navy stationed in Bahrain. We'd order food while out in the patrol boat, and some poor delivery guy would be out on an abandoned pier, sometimes at night, in the pitch black, when a heavily armed boat would pull up, hand him his money, and we got our food. They just acted like it was par for the course. They must have had some good stories. Eric the Mage, or Madge, posted, I was stationed at Campbell at the exact same time. I thought the post as a whole was kind of creepy. The shadows of Vietnam did hang heavy on it. Everything in the army seems shiny and new now. I was in a long time. But back then, the equipment and buildings dated from Vietnam to all the way back to World War I, and thanks to years of budget cuts, looked like it. Really, the only new things were the battle dress uniforms. Chances are Robert was still carrying an M1911A145 caliber pistol. Those guns were awesome when new, but by 88, the newest were made in 1965, about, and some in World War II. Most were so worn out they barely worked. The Army phased in the M9 Beretta pistols the same year. While I heard some spooky stories, I never experienced anything supernatural there. Pizza was ordered from the field, though, even before cell phones. There were range towers that had landlines you could break into and order pizza on. The delivery drivers were often moonlighting soldiers or former soldiers who knew the MGRS, the Military Grid Reference System, which is the mapping system used by uh, military maps. They could navigate out there as long as it was a coordinate near the road. Rumor had it, one pizza company even had its own and Perk 77 radio, which is a military-grade radio, for taking field delivery orders. Sapper Joe posted, Your story of the pizza guy reminds me of a training exercise that I had in the Army National Guard back in the very early 90s. We were told that the Op 4, which is the opposition forces during a training event, they're the enemy forces that are role players, was using a certain paved road in the training area and to set up an ambush on it, which we did. Someone forgot to prevent the road's access to other people not involved in the training. So, some unlucky civilian employee got on that wrong road. Luckily, she didn't drive her car into a tree when we started to open up with our blanks, smoke grenades, and artillery simulators, then rushing the car for intel. It did take a while to finally calm her down when we realized that she was not part of the training exercise but I am sure she always had a good story for parties after that. David Fralini writes, United States Marine Corps, 1964 to 68. This Fort Campbell story reminds me of walking guard duty at the French Creek area at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Some people say Camp Lejeune. And as for fun in the jungle, well, the only jungle I've ever been in was in Vietnam. And I don't recall having any fun times in that jungle. Semper Fi. Hoorah, and God bless. I want to thank everyone who took the time to share their stories in the comments. Although these stories unfortunately don't include all of the ones shared, I did my best to keep the story selected here relevant to the general nature of the episode itself. Thank you for listening. I look forward to reading and sharing more of your personal stories in future videos. Take care.